All right, hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is September 24th, 2024, and you know what we're going to be doing. We're going to continue to seek and search because clearly the understanding that, that I believed we had to this period of time still hasn't been completely understood. We've got so much revelation over the past seven years. We've got from the beginning to the end. Now, as I've been saying over the last while, we're looking for that final cherry on the top that will complete by beginning the tribulation, the end of days with the pre-trib escape. Brothers and sisters, it's an exciting time. We can see so much happening in the world, and we're going to continue until that time comes to seek and search. Now, am I going to continue always looking for that date? We, no. We understand this period of time that it's connected to, this this uh, a feast that it has to be associated with. And that's why we're going to still be persistent. It seems like how could it possibly be that this feast day still has a connection? Well, that's what we're going to get into today. And before we get into that, I wanted to say thank you to those who had let me know what I had said in the last teaching. And there was a number of people that had let me know, uh, as well as our sister Bibi who messaged me and I'm sorry, but I don't remember the name of someone else who also sent me a, a direct message. Um, but they wanted to let me know that I said 2022 in the last teaching, which was very strange. Here, let's have a quick listen. All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is September 18th, 2022. And now that's weird. September 18th, 2022. <clears throat> Clearly, it was 2024, September 18th, when I was doing the video. So it was very, very strange, and I didn't think anything of it at first. I just put a, a comment under the video to say, sorry, I don't know what happened, um, but obviously it's 2024, my bad. But then I got a couple of messages, and I thought, you know what? Maybe there's something to it. And our sister Bibi actually sent me the video that I had posted here in the ministry on September 18th, 2022. So, you know, yeah, obviously it was kind of strange. It's not the kind of thing that you, that you say, you know, if it's earlier in the year, January, maybe into February, you might say the year before. But to say two years in the middle of September, go back two years, but that was, it was very strange. And at first, I didn't think much of it, and I wasn't even going to bother going to look, but I had two people send me messages, and BB sent me the link of the video in the message. So I thought, all right, what's it going to hurt? You know, I'll go take some time and look into that video because we understand here, and those who have been around for a while, we understand that this has been a spirit-led journey. This, the revelation is entirely spirit-led. Now, does it mean the spirit gives us everything? Here's the date here. Here's No. It's never, ever, ever been that way. There's no thus saith the Lord. There's no dreams. There's no visions. There's none of that. It is diligently seeking and searching out the word, and the spirit is guiding us and leading us in it. Sometimes people send me something, and I go and dig into it a little further. Sometimes I'm going throughout scripture, and as I'm reading and I'm led, and I go into another direction to find what this means to that and how it's connected here, and that's how it's developed over the last seven years, and we have been revealed mysteries hidden till the time of the end, for which we all have understood, and it's undeniable. So this idea of, well, wait a second, you know, Alan, maybe there was a reason, maybe the Spirit did that on purpose to have you say 2022 and not realize it. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look into what it was that was in 22, in 2022 on September 18th, and what it led me to when I looked it up. We're going to share it in a little bit. So remember, I'm not saying, <clears throat> excuse me, that this is it. I'm simply trying to wrap my head around where, from all the revelation we've been revealed, where the beginning of this timing is. And of course, you guys all know very well why I'm still doing it. Because I believe this is the 70th year of Israel in the biblical count. So today, we're going to go into an area 
that if you guys have been around for a while, especially for several years, you'll remember much of this teaching. But this time, I'm going to add more details based on that 2022 video that was posted that I ended up going to seek and search out. And I'm going to show a connection to literal events that have happened and that's taking place right now. And we're going to biblically see if we can understand it and connect it to everything that we've come to understand and been revealed over the years. So for those, like I said, who have been around for a while, you'll remember much of this from about five or so years ago. It might be we actually had the revelation and the understanding back then. But it just wasn't the time. So how could we have known? So with this added information here today and a little bit more time, not much, but a little bit more time, we're soon going to find out. And I want you to remember, guys, remember part of the key in this? We're looking for the understanding of the year's end. So if this is really, truly the 70th year, we are looking for a year's end. Well, one of them has already passed. Could it be the next one? Well, it may very well be with what we're going to see today. And then after today's teaching, <clears throat> when, we, when we continue forward until that time, it'll just be back into diligently seeking, seeing what other things we can dig up and connect and, and show in the big picture to help prepare us and draw us closer, to, to ready our hearts for the remnant workers, for the pre-trib, to dig in and draw closer to the Lord, and for those being prepared to serve the Lord, as that remnant portion of the bride, we're going to find some new details to really prepare us for an understanding of what's coming. And I've got an idea of what I'm going to do on the next one as well. It's pretty wild. And I think it's definitely something we should prepare ourselves for. All right. So with that, I'm going to share on something I, I really haven't gone into too much lately because I thought we were at the end. But for anybody that's new to the ministry, see this link right here, this playlist on YouTube. You can come to this playlist video right here or, or series called the Revealed End Time Study Note Series and watch the first four videos. The other place you can go is right here from to ministryrevealed.com. This is ministryrevealed.com right here. You click up on the menu and you come to intro. The first four videos here are the same as the first four videos there. And the reason I like to always recommend, or almost always recommend people start here if they're new, is because you're going to hear some things that are going to seem like left field to you if you've been following prophecies from other people, uh, uh, revelation, understanding. Everybody will have told you things that are only partly half, kind of almost sort of half understood. And the understanding of this revelation all comes from what we call the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to that then revealed to us the years of the end of days. This is the first video right here called Intro to the End Times Revelation. This is a 22-minute intro video to the next uh, three videos that follow. So it'll give you a glimpse into what the next three teachings are going to be about. You can simply watch it right here. If you want to save these videos, you can one-click download them. Here's the second video. It's called Who the Gospels Are Speaking To. If you've ever, and it's only a 30-minute Bible study, and then there are deeper ones that go as you go further in. But this is a 30-minute intro into this differences within the Gospels. So in the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, people have always noticed that there were differences of the same stories. And we've been told that it's perspective. Well, when you understand that there's the was, the is, and the is to come. From creation to Christ is the was. The is is from Christ till the moment of the pre-trib. And from the moment of the pre-trib till the end is the is to come. So it's the was, the is, and the is to come. What the world has been teaching is they're trying to show the is to come through the lens of the is. And in so doing, they've missed the revelation of the Gospels and what these differences are all about. And so everybody remains in the Gospel of Matthew to try to show everything about the biblical end of days. And they've missed half the story, a little bit more than half the story, really, because the differences in the Gospels. For example, one of the favorites I always talk about is when Jesus is going to the cross 
in Matthew, Mark, Luke, you're going to find out that the last is first and the first is last. So in the end of days, Matthew, Mark, Luke becomes Luke, Mark, Matthew. And you're going to realize it's pre, mid, and post. So when you see in Luke's gospel, Jesus going to the cross and he's arrayed in a gorgeous robe. The word gorgeous means white, radiant, beautiful, like, like a bride's gown. In Mark, when he goes to the when he's going to the cross, he was arrayed in purple. Well, wait, something's going on there. That's not just a perspective. That's a completely different color. And then when you go to the Gospel of Matthew, you see that he was arrayed in scarlet, yet another different color. Well, when you take those three colors and you go to the end of days, the bride, the pre-trib bride is gone. So the bride, like the white, gorgeous, radiant robe is gone. And the woman riding the beast, which is tribulation, she's arrayed in purple and scarlet. What are the colors of Mark and Matthew? Purple and scarlet. These are the types of things you're going to begin to understand. And you're going to see that the literal gospel of Luke is talking to the pre-trib bride of Christ and a remnant group who will remain to serve from among them. Then you'll see Mark's group. Mark's group at the end of seals in the seventh year of seals is the time of the great multitude rapture just like it is in revelation 7 at the end of the sixth seal before the seventh seal and then matthew is the return of the lord feet down on the mount of olives there is a taking a taking and a return you're going to see that pre mid and post are all true that's why people can debate about it and show scripture to stand on their ground on what they believe is true in pre mid or post it is absolutely amazing, and this 30-minute intro will begin to blow your mind in the understanding of it. The next piece you're going to understand is that once you understand the Gospels, you'll realize the end of days is not seven years, but it's 14 years and a small portion above, which is 50 days long, called before or above 14 years. You're going to realize that because Matthew has been the one everybody focused on, and they thought Mark and Luke... We're essentially saying the same thing, just a little bit different, because a perspective really is not the case. And when you understand that, you're going to understand the pre-trib happens, and then Luke's discourse, that 50-day period, and then Mark's discourse, the six years of seals, and then the seventh year is the great multitude rapture. And then you've got seven years of trumpets, six years of trumpet judgments, and the seventh, the Lord, excuse me, returns feet down to do a cleanup. In that final 14th year, destroying all the enemies, binding Satan, all of that stuff. And then it's the final jubilee when it's over. This could have only been understood if you first understand who the Gospels are speaking to. And then you start seeing 14 years everywhere in Scripture. This is a 30-minute intro to begin to give you the understanding of it. And then from there... You're going to say, how on earth did we not know this? Well, this is a big teaching. It's two hours and 45 minutes. And in this, you're going to understand that it's all because of Matthew. For hundreds of years, we've been taught through seminaries and everything from the Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, because they've only looked at Mark and Luke and the Synoptic Gospels to just look at as, as little other added tidbits of information that we could take from them to put into the storyline of Matthew. Well, the real answer is Luke, Mark, and Matthew. There are three Gospels, three synoptic Gospels for a reason, but everybody has put them into the timeline and the understanding of Matthew, and Matthew is written to the house of Judah. Matthew is to the Jews. That's why everybody says everybody's going pre-trib. Because they only see seven years. Well, in reality, if it's seven years and seven years, you've got seven years of seals. Then you've got the great multitude of when everybody goes. And then you've got the seven years for the Jews. They've missed Mark seven years. And when you understand and you, you listen to what's being taught in this teaching, it will all click and come together. It's absolutely mind-blowing. And we can show these revelations all the way back. To the beginning of creation it's that wild so with that start there if you're new but you could definitely continue to watch the the teaching here today and um and and have an understanding of what we're looking for the timing of when we're looking for and i want to remind everybody we have our brother and his team over in uganda 
that are now reaching hundreds of thousands of people with their team and those that they've taught and the pastors that they've taught, hundreds of pastors now out there and another, I think, dozen people that our brother um, Steve is working with there. So if you want to support the ministry and reaching more people for Salvation First with Bibles, the Ministry Revealed book, and Cindy's book of testimony, then you can support with PayPal right here. You can also do it in the description box under the video. And uh, we also have our mailing address in the description box under the video as well. So with that, it's an exciting time, guys. You know, the, the roller coaster of emotions in all of this, being Watchmen, is... <laughs> It's it's ridiculous. It is so difficult sometimes in this roller coaster ride, you know, the ups and downs, but the Lord knows why he has chosen us for this. He has given us the strength, he has given us his spirit. And we will not stop. We will continue until that time comes, even if it's 14 more years before it starts. Now, come on. You see all the events and everything going on in Israel? Of course, it's not 14 more years or 20 more years or whatever the case may be. The revelation of Scripture has shown when they come into the land, how to count the years, and it equals this year that we are in right now. Well, in a biblical Hebrew calendar count, there is an end to it. We're going to see what the Lord has to say about that end. And we're going to tie this end with this, this, this uh, live show that we did that I posted on September 18th, 2022, and I'm going to show you what I took out of it and what I was led to and what it equals in the literal season and time we're in right now. Like, it doesn't just kind of equal. It is right on it. It's that amazing. It's right on it. On the date. On the date. It's, it's incredible. So with that, let's get started. You see, this is something, and this is where the, the direction, where we're going into today. You see, in Exodus 34, 22, we've talked about this many, many times over the years. And even recently, when we were looking at this and showing this as a year's end connected to the circuit of the sun. Well, the circuit of the sun is clearly no longer an option in 2022. Uh, sorry. <laughs> See, that time it's because I was talking about 2022 and I just highlighted 22 here. All right. There was a reason. But in, in 2024, okay, it's over. So if it wasn't that year's end, then what if we look to the next year's end and in looking for it, see if there are other connections to the pre-trib bride that are connected to a year's end not being of the course of the sun, but of time, of the lapse of time. And let's see what that gives us. Because this wording here in this one verse in Exodus 34, 22, has had us scratching our head for years and going back and forth on it. And for those, this is why I was saying in the beginning, for those that have been around for a while, you'll remember this. We've gone back and forth on this, and we've taught on this five years ago. But today we're going to add even greater detail into it. Because there's only two options for this year's end. Either connected to the circuit of the sun, but it's past, or the other one connected to the year's end, which is a specific date, which is a lapse of time. And we're going to see if that has a connection to the bride. Because this verse here, is really quite obscure. You have unleavened bread, clearly spoken about, in the month of Abib, tells you where, tells you these verses about it. And then we get to verse 22, and it says, and thou shalt observe, which means to do, okay? You're going to do the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the weed harvest, comma, and, which means it's a separate thing but if you remember, we have a teaching, by the way, if you're new, we have a teaching. I think it's in the playlist, in the, the intro playlist. And it's called um, comma and. 
Karma and is a wild, absolutely incredible revelation of what it means when there's a comma and the word and or no and and a comma or and and no comma. It's absolutely incredible what it reveals biblically, prophetically in the understanding. And so we know that clearly in this, a comma with the word and means this is one thing and this is another. But what else does it mean every single time? They're added together. That they're added together. Let me give you an example of this. One of our, one of my very favorite, Second Peter three eight. One of my very favorite pieces of scripture is Second Peter three eight. Because when you understand this, poof, mind blown, what it reveals about some of the story of creation or the creations. It says in verse 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, comma, and a thousand years as one day. Why would it just be spoken one way and then reversed and spoken the other way? That's because in Genesis 1, there are the days of creation. So to the Lord, they're one day. But if we were there in the midst of time, each of those days would have been like a thousand years. But then it has comma and. Then it, and it says, it reverses it and says a thousand as one day. That's because in Genesis 2, at the creation of flesh with Adam, it then starts the thousands of years that we are living in, in the dimension of time, in flesh, we are in the thousands, but to the Lord God, they're all what? Each of those thousands is a day. Which means if there were seven days and then there's 7,000, that would mean it's seven days to the Lord and seven days to the Lord. We're living in the 7,000 of which the millennial reign is the 7,000th. Then that means those seven days to us would have been as 7,000 and we are living in the 7,000. Ding, ding, ding. See that? Seven days, seven days, 7,000 and 7,000. 14 days, 14,000 years. And the end of days is what? 14 years years seven of seals seven of trumpets but what am i getting at with the comma and these are two separate times but they're added together for to give us a picture of what they're two separate periods of time but they're added together to give one whole picture of that time well that's what's going on or appears to be going on in exodus 34 22. we see here that these two events, the Feast of Weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest, which is that pre-trib Leah bride, it says, comma, and the Feast of Ingathering, which is tabernacles. But remember, we're not looking for tabernacles. Tabernacles has nothing to do with the pre-trib. Our connection is to the year's end. So it's saying that the Feast of Weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest, comma, and so two separate things, being added together so you still have apples on one side oranges in on another and they're going into the same basket to be observed at the year's end you see what it says <clears throat> and this is something that i struggled with so much going back and forth still to this day five years later and it's because in the one verse it has the two uh, uh the two feast times but it says observe once and it has at the year's end, at the end of it. So you're going to observe the Feast of Weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the Feast of Ingathering at the year's end. So what are you going to do at the year's end? You're going to observe both at the year's end. But it seems strange, doesn't it? Because it says three times in a year, they're to appear before the Lord, right? They, they can't be empty-handed, which means it's unleavened bread, Feast of Weeks, and tabernacles those are the three feasts of the lord and they're obviously they all have their three times where they're to be observed to go before the lord however this is telling us a different story in the sense that you're going to observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest so can it be that the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering is what's being observed at the year's end Meaning they're going to be, even though it's observed, the time of the Feast of Weeks is that time when it's gathered. 
but when it's going to be observed for the first fruits of the wheat won't happen until the year's end? Is that possibly what's going on? You see, because that wording is so, it's, it's, not, just, it's not straightforward. So you would think, well, maybe we can go to another place and see what this uh, connection is and see if this wording is separated somewhere else and see what it tells us. Well, we know that it's either going to be a course of the sun or it's going to be the lapse of time. Since the course of the sun is done, let's see if there's a connection to the bride in relation to a lapse of time as being the beginning of everything. Because that's what we're looking for. The year's end, the end being the beginning, right? The end is the beginning, the beginning and the end, hello. So is there a lapse of time at the year's end that's a beginning of time? You guys know who have been around. You know what I'm talking about with that. Well, you know, what about words within this, like ingathering? This word for ingathering of crops, this one is only used twice. So let's see where the other place it's used and see if there's a division within those two that should be taking place. Or is it specifically telling us there's a first fruits that is observed from the Feast of Weeks? that is held to be observed at the at the year's end. So here's the other place we find it. It's in Exodus, so it's only used twice. So we go to Exodus 23, 16. Let's go to Exodus 23, 16, and let's have a more detailed look and see what this one tells us. Verse 16. And the feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labors, so the Feast of Harvest, which is the Feast of Ingathering, and then it, again, it, it gives you a comma to say the first fruits, okay, which is the first fruits of the weed harvest, the first fruits of thy labors. So it's, it's telling you the first fruits of it. So if the, we know that the Feast of Weeks is the harvested wheat. So we know that there's a weed harvest that's taken place, right? The winter wheat, the Leia wheat. But it would seem that from that feast of weeks of the wheat harvest, the first fruits of it, as we saw in Exodus 34, 22, are being held to be observed at the year's end. So let's keep reading in this one. And the feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labors, which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered thy labors out of the field. We'll look at it again, which is in the end of the year. Okay? The end of the year. Look at this word for year. It's a revolution of time. It's talking about time, and within this revolution of time, it also has about striking. Well, we know that there's going to be what? This one, a second time or duplicate, we know that there is going to be a, a striking at the pre-trib that's going to be on Haifa and Tel Aviv, the two northern cities. Well, hasn't there been a lot of action there already? Hasn't there been a lot of action since last year? Hold that thought. Hold that thought. We're going to get there. Well, right here, we're seeing that this one, which has the same two as Exodus 34, 22 connected to it, is telling us that it's not the revolution of the sun, but the revolution of time. That's what we're looking for. And there it is. So let's see what the word end is. The word end tells us to what? To go, to bring out, to carry out. Remember, that's from Luke 24, right? The, the three differences from Luke, Mark, Matthew, carrying compared to receiving compared to him coming and let's look at this to draw forth in the end escape what what you can even see here pluck out now you could say well hey wait a second i thought plucked is only for the harpazo mid-trib great multitude rapture well the overall definition is for the mid-trib great multitude rapture but let's not forget, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the escape that we always talk about for those who are in Christ, spirit-filled above 14 years ago, are like a 
harpazo, are like a plucking. You see? So to see that the escape is also connected in the wording to being carried out, which is only in Luke, compared to the escape, which is in Luke, which is all about the pre-trib, like Luke 21, 36. Hello. That starts to give us a little bit more credibility in this understanding of the year's end being a carrying out at the end or in the end connected to an escape. And here, it's now telling us that the revolution of time we're looking for isn't the sun, but is of time. That's very important. And now we're going to see as we keep going what the rest of these revelations we've understood over the years will add to this story, to see what it may add to the story. So what is this period of time? It's right here. It's called Shemini Aretz, the great eighth day, right? It's called the great day of assembly or the great eighth day. This year, in 2024, it's October 24th. So it leaves us one month to go. It's right here. Okay? I want you to remember it. You're going to see these connections. And it's going to probably blow some of your minds. I got so excited when I saw it. You know, as I dig into Scripture, guys, and we see these connections and the revelations of things that we have understood, when we see this, it really brings an excitement. It's that spirit in us because we're diligently seeking and searching the Lord out. This is what we're looking for right here. So if this is that great eighth day, this would be the time frame of the escape. Okay? Remember, the eighth to the ninth. Okay? It's kind of like that. So this would be the great eighth day. And then this would be the time of the escape, which would begin, of course, also the 50 days. But we'll talk on that later because you go to the 50 days and you end up uh, wherever it ends up. It seems like some random place. But remember, the Hebrew calendar is off, but is the Lord still using it within this season of years, this time that we're living in in the time of the end? Well, you're going to see the scripture does tell us or lead us into this type of thinking. And I'm going to show it to you when we get there. So what do we know about this great eighth day, which is October 24th this year? Okay. This great eighth day. If we go to Leviticus, we see in Leviticus right here that, of course, there's the seven days of tabernacles. And remember, we're not looking for tabernacles. We're looking for the year's end, the end of it. And the end becomes the beginning. We all know this. We know what the eighth day means prophetically in the very end of everything as well. And so what is the eighth day? It's a holy convocation, a holy assembly. Okay. It's not tabernacles. It's the eighth day of tabernacles, which is called the great eighth day. Okay. The year's end and the new beginning. So we know where it is according to the Hebrew calendar, okay? According to the Jews' calendar, we know where it is. But does it connect to that time? Well, you'll remember this because this, again, even though this is something I've spoken about years ago when we were going back and forth on these things, I mentioned it just recently in the last teaching or the one before that as well. You see, in Luke, uh, sorry, in John chapter 7, we're told in John chapter 7 that Jesus was here. And what was he talking about? It's in John chapter 7. He called it the Jews Feast of Tabernacles. Why would he call it the Jews Feast of Tabernacles when the feasts are called the Feasts of the Lord? So why call it the Jews Feast of Tabernacles if maybe it's not the Lord's because it's the Jews and it's the timing of the Jews on their calendar in this season and time? Could that be what it's telling us? Well, this is why it's important. We know in our chapters to years, which if you're new, this is going to go way over your head most likely, but we've got teachings on this. This right here is a chapter to year for Hosea, Zechariah, John, Acts, Ezekiel, Psalms, Genesis, Hebrews, Exodus, and Judges. 
in all of these chapters of their books, we can prophetically show details within each year of the events of things that will prophetically happen throughout the 14 years. And John and Genesis 21 chapters to 21 chapters of John to the first 21, excuse me, chapters of Genesis are very, very, very telling. Very, very telling. And we've shown this even with Hosea and Zechariah, the only two books in the entire Bible that have 14 chapters. So, of course, back in 2018, when I heard of uh, Zechariah being for the Jews and Hosea being to the Gentiles, or you could say like the house of Israel and the Gentiles that are grafted in because Luke's gospel is the pre-trib bride of Christ and they are Gentiles, part of the grafted in, but then the Mark group is the rest of the church that wasn't ready, that were sleeping. They're, they're tied into the world. They may claim Christ, but they're not living like it. They're not living for him. And so they're not prepared. And they're going to remain during seals. Many will fall away. Many more, many, many, many more will come in. And they'll be part of the great multitude rapture. And that is the world, the, the Gentiles grafted in with the world called the house of Israel because the ten tribes scattered throughout the world, even though at first, where were they? They were the northern kingdom of Israel. So the house of Israel was the northern kingdom. The house of Judah was the southern kingdom. And then the northern kingdom scattered. And now nobody knows who they are because they're they're the they're the Christians. They're the church. It's the Gentiles that got grafted in with them because they all got blended together. And it just so happened that there were 14 chapters to the Gentile side of the world, and there are 14 chapters for the Jews in Zechariah. I knew in that moment when I heard this in 2018 that one was to one and one was to the other. And I saw that they were both 14 chapters. I went through the whole Bible to see how many others had 14 chapters, and there were none. I instantly knew it in that time that it would be revelations of chapters to years within, within it. And oh my goodness, it does not disappoint. Zechariah is my absolute favorite for being able to show the timeline of events going on during tribulation. It is so precise, it's, it, it, it's scary. It's all there. But my favorite one in Hosea is chapter 1. And we're going to get to that because you're going to see what I'm talking about. But we're going to start here in John. Because you can see John is in this beginning portion. But the 50 days, you could say, is really in here. Just like the pre-trib of the bride is really in here. Okay, it's, it's this 50 days that comes before, but it's just in the beginning portions of these things. So now watch what happens. As we're here in the chapters to years, okay? Remember, we're, we're in this year right now. We're just trying to figure out where the year's end is in 2024. But as we've known over the years, John chapter 7 already told us. But I, it's hard to understand how there's a connection to the Feast of Weeks that could be connected to the year's end after Tabernacles. Not the Feast of Tabernacles. Again, we are not going at the Feast of Tabernacles. We're talking about the year's end. The year's end. The beginning and the end. The end is the beginning. This is what we're looking for. But it seemed, how could it be? And that's why this Exodus, these two pieces in Exodus, and both of them being connected as showing they're two separate things, but they're being put together to be observed at the year's end. That's what we're looking to understand. So, in knowing John in order, in John chapter 7, let's go to John chapter 7 in our e-sword so we can have the concordance at our fingertips. We know he calls it the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles. And let's see what happens. We know it's tabernacles, but then listen to what Christ ends up saying and to what's being said by the others. Listen to this. And let's start in John 7, 33. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while I am with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. And then he says, You shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am, thither you cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go, that we shall not find him? Will he go to the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? 
That's precisely what's going to happen. That's precisely what's going to happen. Remember, when he returns on the eighth day, he's going to be teaching the Gentiles. That, that remnant portion of the bride is who he's going to be teaching. And then they start asking him questions. But now listen to what he says in verse 37, or what's said about him. Verse 37 says, In the last day, that great day of the feast. What is that last day, the great day of the feast? It's Shemini Aretz. It's the eighth day, quote unquote, of tabernacles, but it's the great eighth day. It stands on its own. It is the great eighth day that the Lord is talking about here. And I'm going to show you and explain why it's important. He then says, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. We know that this is also connected to when he returns feet down, destroys all the enemies. And then that 14th year comes to an end. And then the new beginning is established. Okay. And he says, he that believeth on me, as the scripture saith, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. The spirit wasn't yet given, right? Because he was not yet glorified. Now listen to this. <clears throat> um, verse 40. Many of the people thereof, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. And some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Remember, they start then making fun. Who comes out of Galilee? Right? There, didn't you see, where does it say down here? Verse 52. They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. Well, what do we know about Galilee and a prophet? We know that that's where uh, Jonah came from. Jonah was a prophet from Galilee. And what do we know about Christ? He is coming as Jonah, right? As Jonah was a, a warning to Nineveh, so shall the Son of Man be in this generation, which means the final generation. So we know he's going to be coming again as the Son of Man. Okay? And look at what we end up seeing. We see it ends with this strange verse headed by the woman caught in adultery in John 7, 53. It just, it, everybody wonders why this is here. This has been speculated on many times over generations. Why John 7, 53 is here. And every man went to his own house. Okay, so what are we seeing here? We're seeing the end of the great eighth day. The end of the great eighth day, okay? Which means we're talking about being at the end of this date right here. And then we have this story that begins at this time with the woman caught in adultery. Now we have the woman caught in adultery. And we go to John chapter 8. There's more in this, too, that we can go where 753 shows up somewhere else and what it connects to. But watch what happens here. In John chapter 8, listen to this. So what are we looking at? Well, we've talked much, much, plenty of times from, Genesis, uh, from John chapter 8, verse 1 through 12, many times in giving what it's a picture of. Listen to John 8, 1 knowing that it ended with the title the woman caught in adultery and then it says every man went to his own home and we know that it's the jews feast of tabernacles at the year's end at the end of it at that specific day called the great day which is this date right here what is coming after it it's the woman caught in adultery and this woman caught in adultery, listen to how it starts. Remember, this is what we're looking for, for the connection to the timing of the pre-trib. John 8, 1. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again unto the temple, uh, into the temple, and all the people came unto him and sat, and he sat down and taught them. Wait a second. Those of you that have been around for a while, You'll remember this. 
Let's go to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. Here's all the details of the pre-trip, starting in verse 34. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with the suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Everybody is going to be affected by the pre-trib, obviously. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And in the daytime, he was teaching in the temple and at night he went out and abode in the mount called, uh, that is called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to him in the temple for to hear him this is the pre-trip and this is what we read right after it we go to john chapter 8 the very end of 7 at the end of the great day it goes in to the exact same wording do you know why i believe it is and i believed it for a long long time since we've been showing john in in the revelation of his chapters to years this is the pre-trip. This is the pre-trip. We're seeing it, remember, we're seeing it in the typology because it's an actual event that happened, but within it is prophetic detail laid in over it, under it, hidden in it, in the mystery of it. So now watch what happens. The very next thing that it comes is it says, And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery and set her in his midst. This is a picture of the pre-trip. They're now in heaven. This is the wedding taking place. And listen to what it says. It's a woman, and this woman is mentioned to be the kind that is specifically like a wife. She's been taken, of course, right? To take, to seize, and is described as adultery. And you would think, oh my goodness, adultery? No way. Well, those of you who have been around for a while, you know this breakdown very, very well, don't you? This word for adultery, yes, it can mean adultery, like what took place in that situation. But in the understanding of it, adultery is also a picture of a Gentile, right? Because before Christ, Gentiles were lost. They were, they were, they were uh, falling into idolatry and adultery of all sorts of things. It wasn't until he turned to Christ to the house of Israel because the Gentiles were then grafted in that they all had their time. So adultery represents Gentile. And I'm going to prove it to you. You remember this. All of you who have been around for a while will remember this from Ruth chapter 2. But I'm going to add some incredible new details to this storyline of Ruth. Because remember, Ruth also has to stay till the end of the weed harvest. Well, if there's a weed harvest of the winter wheat and of the spring wheat, you know, there is a staying till the end of it. Well, the end of it would be the year's end as well. So, but that's a side note. Watch what happens here. We see Ruth right here. In Ruth chapter 2, verse 10, she says, uh, it says, Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground. Do you remember this? We just spoke on this in the previous teaching or the second last teaching this is a picture of luke 17 when there were the the 10 lepers and only one returned that's a picture of everybody of the church the 10 being the 100 percent of the church and only 10 percent turning and giving thanks and praising the lord and falling down on our faces before him being grateful for what he has done for us, while the 90%, while the nine other lepers went on just rejoicing, saying, oh, yeah, great, 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 and never turned to give them thanks. That's the 90% who remains. That 10%, that leper, is a picture, as I've said many times over the years, of the pre-trib bride, just as Ruth is, who has done the same thing, fallen on her face and bowed towards the ground, and says, why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take uh, knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? A stranger. Look at one of the definitions for it. Foreign, non-relative, adulteress. Huh. 
You see, it's the description of a Gentile, a foreigner, everybody who's non-Jew. They're called Gentiles, strangers, adulterers. Okay, this is what we're seeing, this exact same picture in the story of Ruth. Well, watch this. Let's see where another connection is. Remember I told you Hosea chapter 1 to the Gentiles, 14, 14 years? Watch this. Look at the connections that we find here. In Hosea chapter 1, verse 2, it starts with the beginning. Remember, guys, we're looking for the beginning and the end. The end is in the beginning. We may have just found it. And when you see how the numbers connect to events that have taken place in the world, it's going to make a lot more sense. It's called the beginning of the Word of God by Hosea. Hosea, of course, is deliverer. It's a name for Yeshua, right? To rescue, to get victory, Savior, salvation. Hosea is a picture of Christ. So it says, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, go take unto thee a wife, a wife, an adulteress. There's adulteress again. And wife. Didn't John chapter 8 say that that woman was specifically a wife and she was defined as an adulteress? Just as Ruth. And she's called what? A wife, adulterous wife, which means Gentile wife. And, and she's even defined more by being called of whoredoms, which also means adultery. Do you get it? Adultery, adulteress, whoredom, wife, Gentile bride. All three, you just saw it from John 8 to, to Ruth, the connection to Ruth to the leopard that turned one out of 10 or 10%, which is the what? The first fruits of the weed harvest to be observed at the year's end. All part of adultery. But you want to see where it gets even better? Because of this word beginning, we, we've looked at it before, but I had never caught this because remember, I hadn't fully accepted the potential that the tekufa, that the beginning, that the year's end that we were looking for, I believed was of the course of the sun. So now the course of the sun is over. And if it is going to be this year, then we're looking for the what? The lapse of time. Time. And that's what Exodus 23 revealed, that it was the one of time and not of the sun. So, if we're looking for this one of time, let's see what Hosea chapter 1 has to say about it. The beginning. So, the beginning, when the father tells the son to go get his Gentile bride. Let's see what the word beginning is defined as. In a sense of opening, a commencement, beginning. Look at this. First, relating to time. Time! Time. The first in relation to time. Time. I got really excited as I was putting this teaching together and I saw this. It was the first time it had dawned on me that this was the one that we'd been looking for because we're looking for this, for this information. We're looking for this pre-trib bride. And is it the circuit of the sun or the revolution of time? According to the beginning here, it's telling us it's the one of time. The one of time. So somebody might say, well, how do you know that Hosea is to the Gentiles? How do you know this is specifically a Gentile bride, even though it says wife and it says whoredoms, and we just showed you all of that? Well, let me make it more clear for those who haven't seen this. Let's go to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Romans, what an incredible book Romans is. We have a, a three-part teaching on it. I think it's like eight or nine hours over three parts. It's all about the pre-trib and the remnant workers from her. It's awesome. Okay? That's probably why so many people that love the Lord and seek him really love reading the book of Romans. It makes so much sense when you could see and understand uh, who it's speaking to, to those really in Christ spirit-filled. Now listen to this. 
let's start uh let's start in romans 9 22 what if god willing to show his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction and that he might make known okay that he might make known remember the whole world is going to be caught off guard by this right that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had before or afore prepared unto glory okay those predetermined listen look at the word vessels specifically a wife hello specifically as a, a, a wife but also as contributing to the usefulness of her husband so what do we know we know the pre-trib is the gentile bride and this gentile bride has a remnant who's going to remain to serve him contributing to the usefulness of her husband verse 24 even us whom he hath called not of the jews only but also of the tada gentiles as he saith also in hosea okay the the greek word oh uh hosi which is hosea okay it's used one time in the greek and there it is right there so you could see it's literally telling us about hosea but now what does it say about hosea i will call them my people which were not my people who the gentiles and her beloved who her beloved which was not my beloved her beloved the the one that he loves and the one that he also calls friend to be a friend to kiss to love okay who the gentiles his gentile bride that he just told us in hosea would be the beginning as a revolution of time and he calls her his beloved that was not his beloved his beloved that was not his beloved you guys of course remember where this comes from we go to song of solomon's something solomon we just recently shared on and look at this song of solomon 6 3 I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. So he's a beloved, but she's also a beloved. And look at the word, 1730. Remember, we're looking for love and friend. Look at this, to love, a love token, lover, friend. Who is this friend that we've been able to reveal in the... Uh, um, in the book of song of solomon remember this in song of solomon we see right here this picture my breasts are like towers so the woman being described as her breasts being like towers who is his beloved as you recall is connected to the gospel of john chapter 20 which is a picture of the beginning of the 50 days which is a big picture of the pre-trib, a remnant in the all of the 50 days beginning. And what's going to happen? It's going to do a circle. It's going to loop around. So it starts here just as it goes from John 7 into John 8. And then the 8 will play out through 9, 10. It'll play out the 14 years into John 20. And then 21 will be the final 14th year. What about Mary Magdalene? First, right? In uh, the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, which is dawn, uh, while it was yet dark. And what's Mary Magdalene's name mean? Watch this. Tower. Her Greek name means tower, and it comes from the Hebrew name or the Hebrew word tower, the pyramid of the bed of roses, which is the description of the Song of Solomon and his bride, that had a direct connection to my beloved's is my uh, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. Just like in Hosea, just like in Ruth, just like in John chapter eight. Because John has it in order for us. 
What comes next in John chapter 8? There's the specifically a wife, adultery, Gentile bride. This is what's taking place. This is the wedding in heaven. And then what does it say? They want to stone her. You guys will also remember this if you've been around for a while. They want to stone her. And Jesus stoops down, writes on the ground. So remember, everybody's around him. And he's now stooped on the ground, writing with his finger. And this woman, specifically as a Gentile bride, standing before him while he's bent over and writing on the ground. And then it says, so when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up. Remember this lifted, right? We've shared on this as well. Almost like this taking up, if you will. And it says, and he lifted himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, who is without sin? Who is without sin? Who is among them? Only Jesus, right? He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. So only one can cast a stone. That's the one who's without sin, which is Christ. And why is this incredible to also understand? Because you'll remember another one of my famous places to go to is Luke chapter 22. In Luke chapter 22, you'll remember this. And I'm going to start with my one of my favorites, uh, one of my favorite funny places. I always get a kick out of this. In Luke 22, 36, listen to what he tells them. And he said unto them, but now he that has a purse, let him take it. And likewise, his script and he that has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. So out of everybody there, whoever doesn't have a sword, Sell your garment, sell whatever you have to to go get a sword. That's what he's telling them. But I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. Who reads this and says, okay, I get it. <laughs> Nobody, except I believe us here in this ministry. Nobody. He's talking to a group of people. Whoever doesn't have a sword, sell your garments and go get a sword. He finishes the next verse and they turn around. So you could see they're having a conversation amongst themselves as he's saying the next verse. They're like, hey, you got a sword? You got a dog. Dude, who has a sword? Hey, you got one. Oh, who else got a sword? I'm not going to go sell my garments yet. No, I, maybe later I'll go do it, but who else has a sword? Oh, you got a sword? Okay, we got two. Let's ask them. And so they turn around. They're like, uh, Lord, we got two. And then Jesus just says, uh, okay, that's enough. <laughs> it's the funniest thing to picture that, I, that I've read in Scripture. It's hilarious. And for him to respond with saying, oh, that's good. Okay, that'll do it. Why? Why was two good enough? Because we know that there are two battles in the end of the Lord. There's one at the end of the sixth year of seals, which is the Ezekiel 39 war. And it's called the, the battle. And then there's the war, the greater one, that takes place at the 14th year, which is the seventh year of trumpet judgments or the 14th year of tribulation. And that is the one where it's... Uh, um, uh, uh, where his garments dipped in the in the blood of grapes and all that, right? It's the it's the wrath of God, the wrath of the of grapes, right? So there's two swords in the end. I mean, we could show this. It, it's so incredible. We got teachings on this where it talks about you know after that battle they'll they'll beat their swords into plowshares, but then you've got another piece of scripture that says they're going to beat their plowshares into swords. That's because there's seven years in between those two battles. The end of the sixth year and then the 14th year. So you got the seventh year of seals, six years of trumpets, that's seven years. And then they're going to beat those plowshares back in pruning hooks back, back into swords for the 14th year, which is the second battle, second sword. It's absolutely awesome. But now listen to what he says. This is only in Luke's gospel. This is why it's so important when you understand the differences in the gospels and what they're prophetically telling us. 
he goes up to the Mount of Olives to pray. His disciples followed with him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that you enter not into, te into temptation. And in verse 41, Luke 22, he says, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast or a stone's throw away and kneeled down praying and prayed. What? Why would it be mentioned that he was a stone's throw away from them? What's the point? Why not just keep it as it was with the others and just say he went down and prayed and, you know, he was within eye, he was within sight of them or he was within earshot of them or whatever. No, we're told that he's a stone's throw away. Why? Because remember, we know what it means because of the revelation that prophetically the disciples who are remaining, who are the remnant of the Gentile bride, are the disciples, and he's telling them that he is a stone's throw away from returning. That's what's going on. That's what we're seeing here in John chapter 8. We know that this stone's throw, the pre-trib is gone. John 8, 1. There's the wedding story taking place in heaven. And in the midst of this wedding week, well, wait a second, how would this play out then? <clears throat> that would mean there's the eighth day, and then it was the end of the eighth day, and they all went to their own house, and it's the story. Boom. Like the end of Luke 21. The, the escape, the pre-trib happens at the year's end, at the time uh, uh, year's end, at the, circuit, uh, uh, at the uh, uh, um, lapse of time, not of the sun. And here we are at it on the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles when it's over at the great eighth day, the last day, the year's end. And it goes in from there to John 8, 1, and it starts with the end of Luke 21, right after the conversation of the escape, which is the word for end defined as escape in the year's end from Exodus. So here's your pre-trib taken wedding. This is what we're looking to. This is your pre-trib, the escape taking place early in the morning over there, which would be at our time over here, so very early in the morning. And remember, just as we've been saying, it might go sunrise to sunrise, or it might go sunset to sunset. Okay? I believe it most likely goes sunrise to sunrise. And again, we showed that in John. You see in John chapter 1, it was um, the, the first day of the week. It was early while it was yet dawn, right? Or while it was yet dark because it was dawn. And then later in John, it says he came the same day at evening. The only way you can have that wording is if it goes from day to evening, which means or a complete day goes from sunrise to sunrise. Okay? So if this is that great eighth day, that means, but right before sunrise is the end of it, and there's your sunrise to sunrise. So the bride would be escaping at the time frame it would appear of dawn right here on the 25th. If we are on, uh, on the west of the world, uh, you know, the Americas, then you would be sometime over here on the 24th. Okay, so the 24th to the 25th. And that would be what? So you would be, just for easy sakes, here it is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's the wedding. There's your seven-day wedding, which means the Lord would have to come back at the end of the 31st, so the 31st into the 1st would be when he comes on the 8th day. John chapter 20 explains this to us as well, right? If we go back to John chapter 20, as I was talking about, we see this. Mary Magdalene, early in the, very early, right, which is talking of dawn. The pre-trib is taken. Um, she's to go tell the disciples, I have not yet ascended unto my father. Then she ascends. And then he says in verse 19, then the same day at evening. That's because when the pre-trib bride is taken, the Lord will then return on the same day at evening and anoint not his disciples, but his apostles. There will be a new modern group of apostles that he will anoint with the Holy Ghost in the evening 
of the escape that happened in the daytime of the pre-trip. And then when does he come back again? If that's your seven-day wedding, then the Lord's returning on the eighth day, which is the 31st, into the first. That would be the eighth day. And when he returns here, this is when he's going to then meet on the eighth day with the disciples that were forewarned that the pre-trib was going to happen just moments before and to be ready when he returns from the wedding. When he returns from the wedding, we all know the story. He's going to have that banquet meal with them. The story from Luke 14, you have the wedding first, and then he's going to have a banquet meal, and he's going to have it with the uh, um, uh, Smyrna church, the remnant workers, that, that bride that will put their necks on the line for him. He's going to have that banquet meal with them, and his 40 days will begin. Remember that. Then his 40 days will begin. It is so vitally important you remember his 40 days would begin here when I'm going to show you a count in a little bit that is directly connected to the season and time that we've been in and we are in right now. It is awesome. It is so awesome. Okay? So now, <clears throat> going back to John 8, what do we know about this stone's throw and its timing? Well, if this represents the pre-trib, there's the, the wedding taking place, and he's talked, they want a stoner, and Jesus says, essentially he's saying he's the only one that can cast a stone. And we see in Luke, the only place where it's talked about, where he's a stone's throw away from the disciples, and we know that in the midst of the wedding week, there's going to be a stone's throw. And this stone's throw is going to bring chaos upon the earth. And what's going to happen is that's what he's telling them. He's a stone's throw away. When you see the stone coming, know my remnant bride, know my remnant workers, my servants, that will be the, the little Christ, right? That will be the little rocks. That will be the light that he's going to give us. That will be the little lambs. Be ready. Look up when you see this coming. Well, where does that bring us to? We know that that stone's throw is happening in the midst of the week. So when we go to Luke chapter 21, when do we know that is? It's got to be in the wedding week while he's in heaven having the wedding. And before he returns to begin his 40 days as Jonah. Well, look at what we see in Luke 21, 25. This is the coming of the Son of Man to begin his 40 days. It says, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. This is the timing of the stone's throw. This is the stone's throw. It's breaking through, and I don't know how much it breaks into pieces or what, or if it's just one they're seeing coming that's going to cause this chaos. That when his remnant bride sees this, look at what it says. And then, shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. This is the pre-trib bride. Uh, sorry, this is uh, uh, the Lord coming to begin his 40 days on the eighth day after the seven-day wedding. And this stone's throw is taking place where he has pre-told them that this stone that is coming... In Luke 22, he's letting them know that when you see this stone's throw, I am on my way. I am coming. So he's letting the remnant bride know, not the pre-trib. She has already been taken. They will have no part in any of it. That's why Luke 21, 36 says, Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. And to stand before the Son of Man. They're going to escape everything listed in Luke 21. That's why we know that Luke 21, 25 through 28, 
is about the Lord coming to begin his 40 days. And who is he coming in that redemption? He's coming to the remnant bride, his workers, his Smyrna, his Luke 24 guys. It's his remnant workers. And he's already told them he is a stone's throw away. So when we see that stone's throw, be ready. Be ready. Because while the world is in fear and men's hearts are failing them, you guys are going to be looking up, ready to receive me. Okay? And what does this bring us to? Well, watch this. Go back to John 8. You see, you see how everything's tracked? The exact storyline, pre-trib, wedding, stones throw in the midst of the week, and then the Lord's going to be coming at the end of that week to begin his eight days, right? And what do we know is going to happen right at the moment after the pre-trib? Israel is going to be attacked in the north in Haifa and Tel Aviv. There are two northern cities that are going to be attacked and devastated, not completely destroyed, but devastated in this attack. And it would happen where this attack and this battle will last until the end of the seven days, right in the, in the time frame of the end of the seven days. And then it will settle because they don't want World War III to fully break out. It will settle. Wait until you see these connections. It is going to blow your mind. Remember, from the 22nd of Tishri, boom, everything begins from what we're seeing here, from the year's end. And then this would be the beginning, right? From the 31st into the 1st would be the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man. Starts. Escape. Wedding's taking place. The remnant bride is watching and praying. They're, they're waiting for his return. They know that a stone's throw is coming in the midst of this week. Men's hearts will be failing them. And they know to be looking because he is only a stone's throw away. And he's the one who's throwing that stone. And that when he comes, when we see these things, we look up that remnant group and we will see him coming. And he will be here on the eighth day. Okay, well, what do we know about that? If we go back, as I said, to John chapter 8, when he comes on the eighth day, it's exactly the wording of John chapter 8 and what follows next. You see, John chapter 8, 1 through, what is it, 11, is the pre-trib and the week wedding. Verse 12 is the beginning, is when he comes to begin his 40 days as the Son of Man, reveals himself to the remnant workers, and then we'll have a meal with them. And within this week, while the wedding was taking place in heaven and the stone's throw is being released, there's also the attack that will happen on Haifa and Tel Aviv by Iran and their proxies that are with them. How long have we been talking about this? For years! For years! Have you noticed anything happening recently? Hello. Have we been saying it would settle down? No. It will not settle down till this event happens in Haifa and Tel Aviv. And it'll be the start with the pre-trib and then Haifa and Tel Aviv. And then what does he come as? Then it says in verse 12, when he's coming to begin his 40 days on the eighth day. It's the eighth day of the 50. So there's seven day wedding. The eighth day he comes, he's here for 40 days, and then there's three days until the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And look at what he says in John 8, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is what happens after that seven-day attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv after the seven-day wedding. So let's go to my favorite, another one of my favorites. <laughs> I got a lot of favorites, right? Of course I do. And listen to what happens. We've known this for how long as well? Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. Nevertheless, the dimness shall, shall not be such as was in her vexation when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. These two northern nations in Israel 
are a prophetic picture of Haifa and Tel Aviv. There is going to be a light affliction that will bring destruction to Haifa and Tel Aviv. And afterward, did he more grievously afflict her by the way of the coast beyond the Jordan of Galilee uh, of the nations? What's he talking about? This is the first affliction, the light affliction coming on Haifa and Tel Aviv during the one-week wedding. Right after the pre-trib, this is when the attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv will take place. Then he talks about afterward a more grievous affliction which is the one down here when Syria comes in Isaiah 9, 12, the Syrians be, uh, before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. For all this, his anger is not turned away, um, but his hand is stretched out still. This is the attack that happens at the end of the 50 days. When the 50 days come to an end, the Holy Ghost will anoint that remnant group of disciples. And they will go out from Jerusalem, as we've taught many times over the years. And then when they go out, boom, now Jerusalem is attacked and destroyed and the Jews will flee to the mountains. This is what Luke, uh, what Jesus has been warning about and told us in Luke's discourse the whole time. And that attack on Jerusalem by Syria and those with Syria will be the beginning of the 14 years at the Red Horse Rider. But look what happens after the light affliction, the, the first attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv that brings some destruction. Look at this, verse 2. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? It doesn't only sound familiar, it's the exact same wording in the exact same timing of when this is going to take place. See, do you see all the connections? Pre-trib, wedding, while the seven-day wedding's taking place, it's the stone's throw, and in the midst of that week, we know Haifa and Tel Aviv are being destroyed, and a, an, and a full-out Middle East war will take place, much more than it is now. It'll be settled. There's a stone's throw coming that the disciples are going to be watching and understanding when it comes. They're going to look up while the world is freaking out, and know that the Lord, who said he was a stone's throw away, is now coming, and that their redemption is nigh. And then what happens? He starts his 40 days on the eighth day, which would be October 31st to November 1st, where he says he is the light of the world. This is when he shines that light on that Gentile remnant group. That's when he's coming to shine his light on them. Which is, again, let me show you this one. I think we'll talk about it briefly later. Which is just like Luke chapter 11. When we see, he tells us that there will be no sign but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall the Son of Man be to this generation. Jesus is going to be, as Jonah was, a sign to this generation. He is coming for 40 days to warn as he said he would. And look at what happens when he comes to warn. This is only in Luke's gospel. Again, another reason for understanding the purpose and the depth in the prophetic revelation, it means to have these differences in the gospels. Look at this. The light in you. We've got a teaching on this as well. The word light is used, I think, seven or eight times, maybe nine. One, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, eight times the word light or lighted is used, and I think five or six of them are different definitions. That's why the Strong's Concordance is so important. Why is this here at the conversation of him coming as Jonah was for 40 days? Because he's coming to shine his light, and he's giving his light in this revelation that we've taught on. He's giving his light to that remnant group of workers who are going to take part in his glory, because in the end, they're going to be resurrected to rule and reign with him, having served with him and been beheaded for him, for his sake, to help bring in the great multitude rapture, who are his people, the people of light, from his creation in the beginning, in the days of creation. It's wild. It's all there, laid out for us in John chapter 8. So, 
if John chapter 7 is telling us it's the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles, and he's talking about it being the eighth day, being the, 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 the great day, which is the last day, and at the end of that last day, he's gone, and they can't go to this place where he's going because it's a picture of the pre-trib bride about to be taken because he's going to take out the Gentile bride, right? Where is he going? To the Gentiles? And when he comes back, what's he going to be? He's going to be the prophet Jonah. Then you've got the literal same wording, again, repeating this, of the pre-trib gone, the bride wedding for the seven days while the attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv is taking place, the stone's throw from Luke 21, and what did Jesus warn in Luke 21 was going to take place? He told him the exact same thing. While this stuff is going on and the stone's throw is coming, when Jesus comes for 40 days, look what he ends up telling them. Now, Jesus is here for 40 days, and he's going to warn, as he said he would, as Jonah did. Luke 21, 20, 24, uh, sorry, Luke 21, 20. It says, and when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. And let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which be in the midst depart out, and let not them which are in the countries enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. This is the beginning of the 14 years at the end of his warning when Syria comes and attacks at the end of the 50 days. This is his warning. It's just like we see in Luke 19. Again, another prophetic picture to him coming for the 40 days. Remember this? Right here, the triumphal entry. The triumphal entry of Luke is a picture of him coming for his 40 days. The triumphal entry of Mark is his coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. And the triumphal entry of Matthew is his coming at the end of the 13 years of tribulation or the, the end of the sixth year of trumpets to start the seventh year. This is when he comes for his 40 days. We've talked about the story of it. We've broken it all down for the triumphal entry. And what does he do when he comes for the 40 days? Just like he did in Noah, in Jonah, he was coming and he was going to shed his light just like he said he would from John. Just like he said he would in Isaiah. And look what we get here in Luke 19, the same prophetic picture of when he's coming for 40 days. He weeps over Jerusalem. This is only found in Luke's gospel, of course. Luke 19, 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou had known, even thou, in this thy day, um, <laughs> in this thy day, the things which belong to thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemy shall cast the trench about thee, and shall compass thee about, and keep thee in on every side, and they shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave <clears throat> in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thine visitation. That is his same warning. That Jerusalem is about to be compassed about, and destroyed and to flee it's it's the same thing of what he's talking about when he comes to shine his light in the darkness to warn them that yes you had the light affliction but now the greater affliction is coming you see how crazy that is these connections to this time is it, it, it was hard to grasp but because of this understanding that we've bounced back and forth with in exodus we knew that there was this possibility that there was this first fruits of the Feast of Weeks that would be carried to this year's end. And the one year's end is over. And we saw how Hosea told us that it was the year's end of time. And the other Exodus showed us that it was of time. That was extremely, extremely powerful for us to finally be able to see this right here, this is what did it for me. This right here. This commitments, commencement, this opening scene, this beginning is called the first in the relation of time. Kind of interesting that it's 22 times as well. This was the key. For me, anyways. This was a huge deal. Because this is now when the Father says, Go get her. It was a big deal. <clears throat> it 
Now I'm going to show you how it connects. Watch this. Christ resurrected. He didn't go around being a warning. You see, it was prophecy built into the gospel. <laughs> I've got it on super play, but fast play, but uh, we don't actually need to see or to go into what's being said. I just want you to see that I'm in Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 3. So remember when I told you guys that that people had caught it, that I had said September 18th, 2022, which was, I mean, it made no sense why I would say 2022. Well, it turned out on October, uh, on uh, September 17th, 2022, we, we did a live show with Mike from 165 and Yanni and Brian and some others were there. And within it, when I shared on it, other pieces that I was showing to connect to this were other pieces we've already talked about in the past. But the one thing that stood out on me, because remember, I received two messages saying, hey, maybe this is a spirit-led thing. Maybe you should go check out what the teaching was that you spoke on in the video that you posted September 18th. You see that? September 18th, 2022. And the title of the video is called Season and Time. How cool was that? Because we're looking for the season and time. We're trying to discern and understand these things. So I see that the only thing that really stood out for me was that I was in Ezekiel chapter 3. So I went into Ezekiel chapter 3. And we know that Ezekiel is also called the Son of Man. Right? He's a, he's a picture, a type of Christ. And we see this. So I went to Ezekiel chapter 3, and there wasn't a whole bunch that stood out. You know, eating the roll, this is like, uh, it's the same as like John. Right? The, the, the Apostle John in Patmos, in the book of Revelation, in chapter 10, after the seventh trumpet, and then he's told he'd have to go prophesy again and do these things, and that he had to eat the scroll. So we're seeing the same type of thing, and he's being told to get to the house of Israel. Uh, they won't listen to you. They won't hearken unto you. And I started thinking, well, we see that there's a seven days, and at the end of seven days, you know, I have made the watchman to the house of Israel to give warning. It sounds like Ezekiel 33, <coughs> which again, we know Ezekiel 33 very well. But we're also seeing that there's this connection to seven days and the end of seven days. And that it, it's about this warning being given. And that they're not going to listen. But as long as you've warned, you know, it'll be remembered and I won't require your blood. And so a lot of these things we've spoken on, many people understand. But this conversation and, and what's going on in here wasn't key enough for, I believe, what I was led to, to figure out. So I went one more script. I went one more slide over. I went to chapter four. And look at what we're told, <clears throat> excuse me, in chapter four. And this is where it all opened up and when you see the reality of what's happening to the reality of this count i think it'll blow your minds but remember what we taught on it before that can show how we could be at the last day watch this in uh ezekiel <clears throat> chapter 4 verse 2 and lay siege against it and build a fort against it, and cast a mount against it set the camp against it also uh, also against it, and set battering rams against it round about. Moreover, take thou unto thee an iron pan, so think Israel, right, their iron dome, and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city, and set thy face against it, and it shall be besieged, and thou, thou shalt lay sieged against it. Listen to this. We've shared on this years ago. This shall be a sign to the house of Judah? Nope. This is going to be a sign. This is a sign to the house of Israel. <clears throat> Who's the house of Israel? Hosea. The Gentiles grafted in with the house of Israel. Judah. Jews. Is Zechariah. Hosea <clears throat> is to the house of Israel. Okay? 
to the house of Israel is Mark's group, is the Gentiles that are grafted in, the pre-trib bride, and then the Mark's group remaining, okay? But right now, we're all here. All of the bride, the, the, the remnant who are going to be chosen, they're all part of this church group. They're part of the 100%, okay? What we were talking about is to show the evidence of the time where the 10%, that first fruits, will be observed at the year's end. And then the 90 will remain, but it hasn't happened yet. So we're still here as the 100% who are the house of Israel. Now, where is Israel? The house of Israel, if this is the land of Israel, the northern part was, of course, the house of Israel. The southern part was the house of Judah. This is going to be a sign to the house of Israel. The house of Israel is no longer the northern part of Israel. They have spread and they're scattered among the Gentiles across the earth. So this sign would appear to take place in Israel, which is the north. And in this northern part of Israel is going to be a sign to the world house of Israel, who would be the church. You follow? Exactly as everybody understands. That's where the house of Israel used to be, the northern part. Now they're scattered throughout the whole world. So could the sign be that there's going to be something taking place of a besieging and an attacking in the northern part of Israel? And it will be assigned to the house of Israel, which is the church around the world now? Well, let's see what it says. Let's see what it tells us about it. Uh, verse 4. Lie thou upon thy left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it according to the number of days that thou shalt lie upon it thou shalt bear their iniquity. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days. 390 days thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. So there's something about the Lord as the son of man, as the Ezekiel type, having to bear the iniquity for the house of Israel for 390 days, connected to a besieging attack. Huh. I started to wonder, but at first, I didn't wonder too much until I read a little bit further. Verse 6, And when thou hast accomplished them, Lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah. The house of Judah, brothers and sisters, has Jerusalem, right? How long is he going to bear this iniquity? Forty days. When he finishes the 390, he rolls on to the other side, and this time for the house of Judah, for 40 days. Okay? 390 and then 40 but the one that was for 390 is going to be a sign for the house of israel which is the world of christians and he's doing it to bear their iniquity before he comes to then what bear the iniquity for the 40 days for the house of judah where are the 40 days of the Son of Man going to begin in everything that I showed you. And everything that I showed, when the seven-day wedding from the year's end, and the seven days, and all the events that we just talked about, and how it revealed it in Scripture, <clears throat> the Lord is then coming on the eighth day. When the Lord comes on the eighth day, what is he coming to do? Fulfill as Jonah did, right? He's going to fulfill as Jonah did. He's coming to fulfill his 40 days as Jonah did. And when he does, we know it's after the, 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 the affliction on Haifa and Tel Aviv, and he's coming to shine his light in the darkness. Hello. Right? So, watch what happens. We know when the 40 days for the house of Judah is. 
That's that's what Luke 21 is all about, right? Luke 21, when he's coming to warn as the Son of Man, he's coming to warn Jerusalem that they're about to be compassed about. When he's doing it, he's going to be doing it for 40 days. That is precisely this one right here. And what does it say? Therefore thou shalt set thy face toward the siege of Jerusalem. He's here warning 40 days to Judah about the siege that's coming. And we know that that siege will happen three days later after the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And it will be the red horse rider at the beginning of the 14 years. Okay? We, I just showed you, this would be the beginning of his 40 days. And what did Scripture say? That when he finishes the 390, he will begin the 40 days. Are you ready for this? I hope you're sitting down. I hope you're sitting down. Because though I thought this calculation was going to be far off, like late November or December, it didn't even dawn on me until I calculated it. Are you ready? <clears throat> October 7th, 2023. Why October 7th, 2023? Well, let me show you. October 7th, 2023 is the greatest attack against Israel that brought about this scaling of war that hasn't been seen since the 1970s. We know that it's significant, and we've been saying since it started, this is not going away until the end of days begins. But what do we know has to happen within this attack? Well, it's going to be the pre-trib and then Haifa and Tel Aviv. Have you seen it getting closer to Haifa or to Tel Aviv lately? Have you seen it getting closer and closer that they've literally evacuated in northern Israel the, the townships and so forth close to the Lebanese border they evacuated 60,000 a couple months ago. They're ghost towns now. And now they're evacuating all of them unto Tel Aviv. And they're keeping Tel Aviv on high alert. And all of those on the Lebanese side are evacuated and going all the way further up north. This is not going away. And it began October 7th, 2023. October 7th, 2023. What are we looking for? A sign. For the house of Israel taking place in the northern part of Israel that will bring about the eventual attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv at the pre-trib escape at the year's end. <clears throat> so, 390 from October 7th, 2023. Boom! October 31st. When I saw this, my jaw hit the floor. Because what is October 31st? This equals the end. This is the end of 390 days from the attack on Israel as a sign to the house of Israel, which is now the 100% still world of church who believe or claim Christ. 390 days from October 7th, 2023, equals October 31st, 2024. And what did it say would come next? 40 days. Lie on your other side for 40 days after the 390 for 40 days for Judah. If this is the end of 390, where does the 40 days start? On the exact eighth day that we showed from a calculation of the year's end. Which would mean that the attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv will be in this time frame moments after the pre-trib escape. Moments after the pre-trib escape. The attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv that will be the final seven days of the 390 is when the attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv will take place 
and it will really get crazy in the Middle East for the next seven days until it settles. Because they don't want to bring about a full-blown World War III. Though it will be coming, it's going to be settled. Because this attack is going to be too crazy for the world to want to accept in the midst of the stone's throw, in the midst of people that have vanished from across the earth, and they're going to settle everything to take a breath. The exact seven days ends at the exact end of the 390 from October 7th attack. Well, do you know, brothers and sisters, when the attack began in 2023? October 7th was the year's end. Was the year's end. The year's end. And what does it equal this year? Right here to the pre-trib escape, leaving seven days for the prophetic beginning of 50 days to begin where they're going to finish the fulfillment of Isaiah 9 and the attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv in the final seven days of the 390. Brothers and sisters, we were looking to understand if there was a sign from the Lord, and I believe we have just found that the sign that we were given in Scripture, the sign to the house of Israel, which is the church, was the attack on Israel that will last for 390 days of which the final seven will be the escape of the bride, the attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv, one year on a Hebrew calendar date to the date when they did it in 2023 on the 22nd, the great eighth day, and they will finish that seven days with an attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv, just as we see happening right now. We are one month away. We are the 24th of September, and this will begin after the 24th of October. And where do we see all of this encroachment and all of this chaos? Northern Israel. Exactly where the warning of the three 190 days would be before the 40 days of the Son of Man, as Ezekiel is called, would warn Jerusalem for the house of Judah. That is bananas. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw it. Add that to the time of the beginning for year's end with Hosea, to the two in Exodus, and we've got the watch of all watches, October 24th into the 25th, at the end, not the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles. Did you see what came first in Ezekiel chapter 3? He said seven days, right? Ezekiel chapter 3 was first talking about seven days. Seven days, seven days, seven days. Right? You have seven days. And then just as John chapter 7, the seven days, and then what happened? The great eighth day, which will be the one-year anniversary on the Hebrew calendar from the beginning of the attacks, and we'll leave seven to the end of 390 before the Lord comes on the eighth day to begin his 40 days. That is unbelievable that we have a count in Scripture telling us it would be a sign for the house of Israel, which is the church. This is crazy. We've never had a count be so perfectly aligned as this ever in a biblical count in scripture given to us in days crazy crazy awesome wild 
unbelievable, right on time, right on track. Some might be saying, oh, but, but, well, no, we, we, we know the 40 days of the Son of Man. We know it's to Judah. We know he, he's telling them to flee because Jerusalem is the one compassed about. We just saw it from Luke 19 when he's coming for his 40 days, and it's when he's warning that they're about to be compassed about. And some of you might be saying, well, wait a second. What about Revelation chapter 12, verse 1? Because Luke chapter 21, at this attack, at this compassing about, uh, sorry, sorry, at the, at the stone's throw, connected to Luke 21, verse 25, when men's hearts are going to be failing, the distress, the sun, moon, and stars, what about the fact that it was connected to Revelation chapter 12? If Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 is to be Virgo, then we have to have the sun in Virgo. How is the sun in Virgo if the sun started in Virgo on the 16th of September? Shouldn't it be done by about the 16th or so of, of October? Nope. Because October, uh, uh, because Virgo is a very big constellation. And in the constellation, the sun is in it for, I believe, something like 44 days. So for us, we still understand that when the pre-trib bride goes right before this sign of Revelation 12.1, this is, this is the beginning of the seven days, right? The signs in the sun, moon, and stars. Men's hearts failing them. This is the events taking place during the seven days, which means within this period, the sun must still be represented in Virgo for this to begin. We'll check this out. The sun starts in Virgo from September 16th, as we've known, but it remains in Virgo until October 30th. So if the sun remains in Virgo until October 30th, then the pre-trib happening here and the stone's throw and everything taking place within this week is still right on target because the sun is in Virgo until September 30th. Oh my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I would recommend you guys take the time to study this out, watch this again, and see it all for yourselves as I have seen it. This is awesome. Am I saying this is absolutely it? No, I'm saying this is the only, this is the, the last option for the year. If not, we've got to wait around till, till this, the, the Taurus count and the Feast of Weeks and all that stuff starting next year. But then we've got no 29 AD in the Sabbath counts. You see, we've got no birth of Christ from 2 to 1 BC and, and putting in the count. We've got no biblical count from Leviticus telling us how to count it when they come into the land before it's theirs to begin. 70 years goes out the window. I don't know what to do. I would have no clue. But I just showed you. I just showed you that the Leviticus 34.22 that we have been trying to understand for so long with the year's end to Kufa either was a course of the sun or a lapse of time. And to understand which one, we just went into Exodus 23 verse 16 and it told us that the year's end of this one was connected to escaping at the end and that the year was connected to that of time, not of the sun. If the sun one is past, and the time one is the one that it's telling us, and the only option we have left in this 70th year is the one of time, here it is. And not only that, it was perfectly in alignment with our chapters to years, going from John 7 into John chapter Eight. I am excited like crazy for this, guys. 
you saw for yourselves. I didn't make the attack happen September 7th on, on the 22nd of Tishri in 2023. I didn't write those numbers 390 and as a sign for the house of Israel and these things happening in the northern part of Israel and be a sign for the world who is the house of Israel. That the 390 ends October 31st, seemingly a random time on the 29th of Tishri, only to find out that it's the eighth day of the Son of Man when he would then begin for his 40 days, which is the warning to Judah for, the, for Jerusalem to be compassed and destroyed. It's awesome. It's crazy wild. Let me finish with one more thing. Check this out. In the chapters to years, uh, as a chapter, no, no. In the Shemitah year counts, okay? This Shemitah year count with the Jubilee ending after the 14th year from 2024, this count is a precise count that brings us back showing all of the Jubilees with the Shemitah years counts, which had a seven-year perfect cycle for the King James Bible when it started and when it was done. It had a perfect cycle from the birth of Christ to when in 29 AD, in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, in Luke chapter 4, when he declared the Jubilee. Okay? We counted the number of Sabbath years from the time of Christ, the first Sabbath year from the birth of Christ, all the way to the number of Sabbath years to the start of the 14 years, meaning we are in the Sabbath year right now when it ends. And for it, we need to be at whatever the year's end is, which was either sun or time. Sun is past, and I just showed you the one for time. And look at which Sabbath it was. It was the 289th Sabbath. Why this was so fascinating is because years ago when I came across this, I recognized and I was spirit-led in this that when I did this count, I had our brother Ivan from South Africa put this chart together for me because I suck at doing these things. And I knew because I had done the calculations in my head that the final Sabbath year that we would be in before it all starts equaled the 289th. And I believe that I was spirit-led to go look up 289. Well, 289, it turns out, is only used one time in the New Testament. And here it is. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, sorry, not 1913. In Luke chapter 13, it's the story of the barren fig tree. Who's the fig tree? The land of Israel, right? Over in Judah, Jerusalem, those guys. They're the fig tree. And what does it say? It says, uh, let's start in verse 16. Uh, sorry, in verse 6. Luke 13, verse 6. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. You see, in Jerusalem, the Jews, he's come looking for, for fruit on this tree and he's found none. So he says, cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? Right? So cut down Jerusalem. Time to cut them down. It's, it's useless. It's not, doing, it's not bearing any fruit. And he says, and he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also. So let it be for one more year till I dig it about and dung it. Okay? What does dung it mean? Are you ready? To throw more or less with violence. To strike. To strike more or less with violence. To, to throw things at it. Right? Flinging, quick toss, deliberately hurling. To smite. So he's saying, let it be for one more year while I strike it, while I smite it, while I throw stuff at it as dunging it about. While I strike it about. While I strike it and throw it down with violence and intensity. Let me do this for this one more dung year. And if it doesn't bear anything, 
then go ahead and cut it down. Hello. Then go ahead and cut it down. In 2023, it started on the eighth day. In 2024, the eighth day is October 24th. One year will be up. One year will be up. Let me dung it for one year. Let me strike it. Let me smite it. Let me cast things at it. And if Israel, the, the, the house of Israel, if the northern part of Israel, if they don't wake up and recognize this, then what does he say? Then cut it down. What happens at the one-year Hebrew calendar anniversary of the dunging it, striking it? You know what it is. You know what it is. Right here, Isaiah chapter 9. He is going to afflict Haifa and Tel Aviv with a strike in the final seven of the 390 days because the dunging it about they weren't ready. They weren't watching. It made no difference. Now it's time to strike it down. The one year of dunging it. Pretty crazy, right? Do you remember this story? How about the rest of this? How about the rest of this? Here he asked for the dunging it for one year. When this dunging it year is done, it's going to be cast down, right? It's time to... Cut it all down. Look what comes next. Do you remember we just did a teaching on this? In Luke chapter 13, the woman who is disabled, right? This woman. Sound familiar like John chapter 8? Specifically a wife who was in infirmity for 18 years and he did lift her up. And then we went into the story, if you guys remember. This, this healing on the Sabbath and talking about the kingdom of God with the story of the mustard seed and that it was what? That it was likened unto the kingdom of God. And in Luke 13, 21, it is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Wait a second. Leavened? Isn't there a story? In the feasts of the Lord, when leaven is used, you mean like the feast of weeks? With the leaven being put into the loaves for the first fruits unto the Lord that is going to be observed with the leaven according to Exodus 34 and 23. The same first fruits from the Feast of Weeks with leaven. Do you get the picture? Do you get the picture? We just did a teaching on this as well. It's all here, guys. We are here. We are here. I'm excited for this like crazy. Let me finish by putting it all together here one last time going into Luke chapter 8. 34, Luke 21, 34 through 38. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with the suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And in the daytime he was teaching in the temple, and at night he went out and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in uh, to him in the temple for to hear him. John 8, 1, Jesus went unto, unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and sat, he sat down and taught.
taught them. Pre-trib bride, right here, the scribes brought the woman taken in adultery and set her in his midst. The seven-day wedding in heaven taken place with the Gentile bride of Christ that is specifically a wife, the adulterous Gentile bride. In the midst of that week, during the time of the sun still being in Virgo, as Revelation 12, 1, after the pre-trib is taken, there is going to be a stone's throw, which is his warning to his disciples that he is coming, that he is a stone's throw away. And when they see this stone's throw coming, they will know to look up because their redemption is coming. He is coming on that eighth day to sit and have that meal with them, and they will remain with them for 40 days when he returns from the wedding, and he will come as the light of the world, and they that will follow him will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And according to the revelation from Ezekiel through Exodus, through the revelation of it all, it goes from the one-year anniversary of the 22nd of Tishri, on the Jews, from the end of the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles, the great eighth day, from John 7 into 8, to the seven-day wedding, for the end of the 390 days, to the Lord coming on the eighth day, to begin his 40 days as the Son of Man, warning, as he said he would, for Judah, for the compassing about, and the coming destruction of Jerusalem that will follow at the end of the final 50 days, when those disciples will then be anointed by the Holy Ghost, go out throughout all the earth, and the Isaiah chapter 9, Syria coming, and those with them will bring about the destruction of Jerusalem, and the Jews will flee, and Jerusalem will be destroyed, and will be left to rest for the seven years of seals, while the world who was warned in the 390 days is warned of what is coming, they will then have their seven years of seals. The seven years of seals to the house of Israel, which is the world, the church. It will be the greatest time of revival in human history in the midst of the greatest chaos in human history to that time. And World War III that will begin at the destruction of Jerusalem, though they will think they will have settled it here. When the 50 days are over and Syria attacks Jerusalem, it is the red horse rider and the beginning of the 14 years at that time. Hence, I can't remember where it ends up being, somewhere around here, is the evidence that if this time is correct, then that means the 50 days and the 14 years begin somewhere in December, showing to us that it really was the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles and not really the Lord God's beginning of the 14 years because we know that the calendars are off. So brothers and sisters, I pray it blesses you and strengthens you because it would appear then, I think, the 50 days ends around right here, the 29th to the 30th of Cheshvan, right here, and this would begin the time frame in here of the 14 years, which would account for the one, two months being off for everything to begin at true Feast of Trumpets. How about that? You know what? Before I get ahead of my skis, let's go check that out. Let's go 24th, maybe 25th. I think 25th would be the beginning. But let's just go 24th. Watch this. Watch this. Let's just see. We're going to do this live right here. Of the seventh month, 24th of September. Oh, wait. No, no, no. We're going to that one. of Because uh, that was the count from when the attack began. 24th of October, 2024. Whoops. Had it in the wrong spot. October, October. There we go. So October 24, 2024. Let's add 50 days and see where we get. Okay, December 13th. So I was a little bit ahead of my skis. Let's see where that brings us. December 13th brings us to right here. You see how that seems like some sort of wacky date, you know, somewhere in here? I believe 
that the understanding of the wackiness of this day is because of what we know of the sun, of course, the two months would make it right here, but we also know that the moon is off, right? So when we account, I bet you when we account for the moon, it would take us to this time frame right here. Brothers and sisters, this is a crazy, crazy, exciting time. And I believe we just may have solved the revelation, the understanding of Ezekiel in literal, physical happening events on earth right now. And we are told they are a sign to the house of Israel. Brothers and sisters, I love you. I am grateful for all of you. I appreciate you all for your prayers. We pray for you and your families every single day. We, we love you. I, I thank you for all of your prayers over us and for each other, for the support throughout the ministry here and around the world, especially in Uganda, and the numbers of people that are being reached for Christ in salvation and in preparation is beyond anything I could have ever imagined in my life. I could only imagine what it will be like when that remnant group is left to be prepared when he returns from the wedding and the power that he is going to bestow upon them and the anointing that they will receive from the Holy Ghost to bring in the great multitude rapture in the midst of the greatest chaos ever, the greatest revival in human history. As wild and as crazy, incredible blessing as it is to see what's going on throughout this ministry and throughout Uganda, just wait for all those ready to serve him in that time. The incredible joy in the midst of chaos that's coming. But until that time comes, brothers and sisters, if you can, please continue to support the ministry until that time comes. And we will continue to work together to bring more to Christ and to prepare them for his season and time for a pre-trib ready bride and a remnant from them who will remain. I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.